Celebrating 46 years on the air, award-winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, record heat in the nation's top agricultural state, the impact wide-ranging. Plus, we reported this before, questions about the environmental value of ethanol. In Southern Gardening, give me five. Gary Bachman has the skinny on pentas in your fall landscape. And in our feature, a pilot program giving Native Americans more control over the quality of their food. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Zach Ashmore. And I'm Mike Russell. Thanks for joining us again here on Farm Week. Weather literally on the radar across the nation, the haves and have nots. In the eastern Corn Belt, rain west of the Mississippi, many stuck in drought. Everywhere increased pressure on harvest, especially in California where temps have been sky high. Farm Week's Jonah Holland reports. California baked under record heat last week. Temps soared to 116 degrees in Sacramento on Tuesday. The state's electric utility asked customers to conserve energy and the voluntary cutbacks reduced demand enough that rolling blackouts were unnecessary. Tuesday's 52,000 megawatts of electrical demand set a record for the state. 27 million of those text messages went out. And within 45 minutes, we saw roughly 2,600 megawatt reduction in uses. Had that not happened, uh, we would have had some episodic load reduction. The state ISO, which is the independent system operator, did not direct any load reduction this year, period, full stop. So there were localized decisions as it relates to issues related to extreme heat and extreme utilization of resources, which are not atypical. The hot weather drove animals at the Orange County Zoo into the pool for relief. Workers on outdoor projects were taking more breaks to avoid heat-related illnesses. The record temps aggravated the continuing drought in the region that helped spread wildfires throughout the state. A fire in the mountains of Riverside County killed two people and has burned more than 20,000 acres. At last measure, the fire was only 5% contained. Hurricane K is complicating the weather in the southwest. It's the closest hurricane to California in a quarter century and could bring flash flooding to California and Arizona. Considerable rain to much of the region. On a global scale, the World Meteorological Organization, the UN Weather Agency, is warning there may be a third La Nina in a row. La Nina events often lead to more Atlantic hurricanes, less rain and more wildfires in the western U.S. and ag losses in the central U.S. When you have La Nina, West Africa, an area going from Senegal to Sudan normally is struck by flood, East Africa by drought, uh, Australia, Indonesia with the flood and so forth. So knowing the evolution of La Nina help us anticipate. The recent floods in Pakistan are believed to have been worsened by the current La Nina. Reporting for Farm Week, I'm Jonah Holland. California continues to have its energy issues, this despite being the first to ban gas-powered vehicles by the year 2035. How it will generate enough power to charge electric vehicles and some of the new electric farm vehicles sure to be available by then remains to be seen. Up next, an abbreviated Farm Week Newswire, and here is Jonah Holland with that. Jonah? Thanks, Mike. Let's get right into it. Food prices shot up 11.4% over the past year, the biggest increase since 1979. The Bureau of Labor Statistics laid out the new numbers this week, showing everything from eggs and flour to milk and meat cost even more. Economists say it's not just because of inflation. Food prices are still affected by global events like the war in Ukraine affecting the cost of wheat. Natural impacts figure in as well, like drought and bird flu. Needless to say, demand for food isn't flexible either. 
According to a report from Bloomberg Law, the U.S. Department of Justice plans on making a strong antitrust push in the coming months. The report says the DOJ has hired an unprecedented number of antitrust litigators with the idea of greater enforcement in mind. If you've watched Farm Week, you already know that many in government are concerned with consolidation in agriculture, especially in the meatpacking industry. Legislation has been introduced to level the playing field between packers and producers and to introduce greater competition. Keep your eye on Farm Week. This is a story that will be making headlines. We'll be following this and other stories as they develop. Zach? Greenhouse gas is a continued target for reduction by governments and environmental groups. Biofuels were introduced as a way to combat climate change, but analysis of emissions data puts that idea into question. Again, Dave Miller has that story. According to an analysis of Environmental Protection Agency data by the Reuters News Agency, ethanol production plants put more than double the carbon per gallon of fuel production capacity into the atmosphere than the nation's oil refineries. The Reuters examination focused directly on processing and utilized EPA emissions data from more than 240 of the country's 250 ethanol plants. In response, ethanol industry groups took issue with the study due to what they referred to as its single focus on one aspect of the biofuels production profile. Officials at the Renewable Fuels Association, the nation's largest trade advocacy group, say ethanol offers significant and immediate carbon savings. In a press release from Growth Energy, the country's leading ethanol trade association, officials stated the study ignored the entire production cycle and the amount of CO2 taken out of the atmosphere from crop production, tailpipe reductions, or CO2 captured for reuse in refrigeration or by the beverage industry. As if the cost of inputs, drought, politics, and supply chain issues weren't enough pressure on farmers to make a living, two million farms in the U.S. working to cover their expenses adds to the pressure. The USDA released its report on how well the nation's farmers are doing financially. Peter Tubbs has more. The USDA estimated national farm income will fall slightly compared to 2021, but it will remain 42 percent above the 10-year average. Cash receipts from the sale of agricultural commodities are expected to surpass $525 billion, an increase of 21 percent compared to last year, driven mostly by continued high demand. While cash receipts are expected to grow, net income is projected to fall slightly due to high input costs and a 50% drop in direct government payments to farmers. Net farm income includes farm and non-farm income, as well as government payments. Production costs are estimated to increase over 17% for this year. A 44% jump in fertilizer prices is the primary driver of the overall move higher. Adjusted for inflation, the increase in the cost of doing business in 2021 is the highest in nearly a decade. Roughly half of the farms in the United States do not depend on farm activities for their primary income and result in median farm revenue numbers that are expected to show a small loss for 2022. On the lighter side, Gary Buckman says, give me five when it comes to your fall landscape. When you're done planting these babies, you can take five and hang five if you like, but five will get you 10. That'll get you a high five when you're all done. Here's Gary. I have to admit that pentas are one of my favorite summer annuals. While they have good tolerance for our summer heat and humidity, they're one of the best color annuals for the fall season. The name penta comes from the Latin meaning five, since each small flower has five petals. The other name commonly used for these plants is Egyptian star flowers. It's common for each penta plant to have up to 20 clusters of flowers at any given time. These plants are known not only for the pretty flower colors, but also for being pollinator magnets. In the fall, as the weather is changing, the pollinators know it's time to get ready for the winter season. I love seeing the different butterflies and bumblebees vying for position on the broad pentaflower heads. 
As a testament to their tough landscape and garden performance, the Butterfly Penta series was chosen as a Mississippi Medallion winner in 2001. Since that time, there have been many more series introduced to the market. Bee Bright Pentas have a compact habit with consistent and uniform flowering. Kaleidoscope Pentas have intense colored flower clusters. These are vigorous growing to about 18 inches. In my opinion, it doesn't matter which series you plant because they all look good. For best flowering, Pentas need to be planted in an area that gets at least six hours of full sun a day. I'm MSU Extension Horticulture Specialist Gary Bachman, and we'll see you next time on Southern Gardening. Well, it's time for a short break right here, but stick around. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, Native American Food Sovereignty. It started with the last Farm Bill, a plan for feeding Native Americans and creating for them more self-determination. These days, the program is expanded, and it gives tribes more control over the quality of their food and where it comes from, all while supporting indigenous farmers, ranchers, and fishermen, boosting Native American health and ag economies. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes their aspirations and their faith, and their right to make their own plans and arrive at their own decisions, and their ability and power to enlarge their lives and plan for the happiness of those they love. I believe that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination, and leadership that these are the keys to democracy, and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest, but also in the interest of society. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations, and their faith. I believe in intellectual freedom to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance toward the views of others. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home, that my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Seems prices just keep rising again. That's right, Mike. We'll talk about that and the reasons for it. But first, the numbers. Going up again, as we said, with one interesting exception. And then our row report. What's moving the ongoing row crop market rise? And finally, an important USDA report on our crop progress. What did it say? Markets on an upswing last week, although it appears to be short term. Seems the bulls went to town and now here we are. Let's, lay, let's take a look. Last week's biggest loss, soybeans down seven and a quarter cents. Seems the reason is a pretty good crop so far. That could change, of course. Last week's biggest gain, wheat up 61 cents. Quite a rise. We haven't seen it this high since early July. However, is it a temporary bump? We'll look into it. Seems one of the big reasons for current wheat prices has to do with so much uncertainty, and by now you could guess why, the Ukraine war and its effects on the global marketplace. However, despite current high prices, there's rumblings on the horizon that this is indeed temporary. Market analyst Elaine Cub explains. There's a lot of subtle little things, and you could kind of go one way or the other. Uh, Russia has a nice big crop. North Dakota, Minnesota are late, late harvesting the spring wheat crop. So there's lots of little stories, but the, the overall impact of each of them together is kind of nothing. I mean, that chart is, 
is pretty flat at the moment, and that may be about as good as we can hope for. I mean, honestly, some stability is, is better than the wild volatility that we experienced earlier this spring. It's hard to get very bearish for wheat because there is always going to be this threat that something new may happen to disrupt those shipments across the Black Sea. Actually, during the month of August, you know, that, that grain corridor was kind of working and somewhere in the range of one million metric tons theoretically made it out of Ukraine. And there's the possibility of lots more coming out of Russia because they had such a big crop and the ruble is weak, et cetera, et cetera. So there's sort of, in my opinion, a bearish tilt to the supply thing. I mean, here in the United States, you look at the futures spreads and the story is that there is bearish ample supply of wheat despite the drought that we have experienced in this country, in wheat country for years now. Nevertheless, we have plenty of the stuff. So you have sort of a bearish tilt, but you can never get too bearish because, yeah, like something strange may happen geopolitically. But let me tell you about the dollar this week. We had a reaction based on what was going on in, in the European Union. They raised interest rates. The euro goes up, dollar goes down, wheat goes up. That's great. That's all fine. But that's sort of a short-term thing until the U.S. Federal Reserve does their own interest rate raise in two weeks. So we have sort of a mismatch in timing between these two central banks. And I wouldn't get too worried about this being a longer-term uh, phenomenon. Moving on to corn, which rose 19 and a quarter cents last week. The expectation being a lower yield this year, which is something we've talked about before. Analyst Elaine Cubb says USDA reports are what will determine what's to come this week. Speculation is one thing. Raw data is another. There could be a lot more that they could do. This time around in September, they may actually change some acreage numbers, taking in some FSA data, which would be unusual. So they could make all kinds of adjustments. Um, I think they can still make adjustments to exports, even though we haven't had weekly export data. They probably have access. They certainly, we still certainly see the daily export sales reports, and they seem to be seasonally appropriate. So there could be all kinds of changes and, and some sort of big reaction on Monday. But again, that's not going to be the longer term reality two weeks down the road. I think if they change corn yield and certainly if they change corn acreage in the September report on Monday, if nothing else, you've got the funds, the algorithmic traders that go through and scrape this data and trade based on the USDA data. Even if other fundamental traders um, already have priced it in based on crop tours or if they're waiting for um, more certainty from, from harvest reports, which are going to be late this year. Nevertheless, there will be some sort of just sort of automatic reaction from computer traders or nothing, if nobody else. And the report Elaine mentioned did indeed drop on Monday along with the WASI report. We'll get into more detail on that next week. But for now, here's what the USDA said. Corn production down 3% from the previous forecast and 8% from 2021. Yields down 2.9 bushels from the previous forecast and 4.5 bushels from last year. Production for soybeans down 3% from the previous forecast and 1% from 2021. Yields down 1.4 bushels from the previous forecast and nearly 1 bushel from 2021. Cotton production up 10% from the previous forecast, but down 21% from 2021. Yields down 3% from the previous forecast, but up 24 pounds from 2021. So, soybeans down a bit, but that could be temporary. According to Elaine Cub, a decent U.S. harvest and the potential volatility in Brazil could see prices go up again. Ordinarily, we'd be panicking about an early frost with the late planted soybeans, but my understanding of the weather forecast so far is that we should expect to see a nice, long, warm, late summer, end to the summer here, and no current threat of early frost that anybody's talking about. So, you know, knock on wood, it might all work out. And uh, yeah, you, you, then this weather, as you mentioned, the, the rain that comes through and falling on these late planted soybeans is still gonna do some good bearishly to production. Generally, our worry is, the, is of the late development. And you see that in the, in the crop progress report, everything is about three to four percentage points behind average pace of, of progress. There could be considerable volatility from the Brazilian real and their currency when we're talking about the dollar's effects on things and the Russian ruble's effects and the Brazilian currency's effect on things. That could be very volatile in October with their presidential elections coming up. So it pays to pay attention to that. Their planting season will probably be nice and fast because the, the current forecast is for, for good rains to get started here. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Seems like we're in for a bearish harvest this year. War and weather the cause, but do keep in mind we still have ample stocks for now. Mike. Thank you, Zach. Obviously, food prices have led to sticker shock. For Native Americans, the 2018 Farm Bill helped producers have a little more control. Now that the next Farm Bill is around the corner, a pilot program still very much on the radar. Colleen Bradford Krantz has more. Under two century old federal treaties, the U.S. government pays for the food given to certain displaced Native Americans. 
Until recently, however, indigenous groups had little say on what was delivered by USDA to their food distribution centers. Slowly but surely, we, we saw that those foods were, were heavily salted or processed, and we went from being one of the healthiest tribes, and we start seeing that our bodies, the bodies of our, our ancestors then, reacted negatively to those. To address the problem, a provision in the 2018 Farm Bill provided $3.5 million for eight tribal nations to demonstrate their ability to purchase their own food, an idea known as self-determination. In our traditional model, the USDA purchases those foods and ship them to uh, warehouses or facilities on the, on the tribal reservations. With self-determination, USDA and the Department of Interior work together to collaborate on a demonstration project, which gives tribes more control over their food procurement. Many of the tribes awarded grants are using the added flexibility to support indigenous farmers, ranchers, and fishermen. We want to contract and decide where we get our ground beef from, where we get our apples from, where we get other products. Two Eastern Wisconsin tribal nations, the Menominee and the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin, partnered on one of the self-determination pilot projects. Although the experiment is ongoing, Gary Besaw, the top agricultural official with the Menominee Nation, says area native producers have begun to benefit from the self-determination project and from another project known as the Tribal Elder Food Box Program. The new food box venture provides fresh meat and produce directly from area producers to Native Americans who are over age 55 at no cost. The program initially included just the Menominee, Oneida, and Red Cliff Band of Lake Superior Chippewa, but now it benefits all 11 federally recognized tribes in Wisconsin. So we're trying to slowly build our economy, we're trying to grow the vendors, we're trying to understand the system better so we can do, we can do that purchasing and create that, our own full localized food systems. The changes in purchasing practices have benefited native producers, some who have seen sales increase since the start of the pilot project, as well as non-native farmers who can be used as a source if indigenous suppliers can't meet demand. We looked at, for instance, the some of the catfish that we were getting uh, in our food distribution for our clients, and we replaced that with some of the foods from Red Cliff. So we were able to use lake trout fillets, uh, whitefish fillets, and herring. One community member says the Tribal Elder Box Program was particularly timely when some tribal members were struggling financially in the wake of the economic slump following COVID. Yeah, I talked to several people and I get them and they like it. They, they think it's great. It's like probably two, three meals worth of food that they won't have to buy. However, Bovine says the biggest challenge may be in convincing high school and college students they might enjoy a career farming, ranching, or fishing. A lot of it was just um, individuals, you know, do individual farming, their own garden, you know, but uh, as a nation, the tribe, our tribe has that fell away from it in time. As far as I know, there's nobody in the last 15, 20 years that I know of that are interested in farming, you know, and that's unfortunate. An hour to the southeast, the Oneida Nation has built a successful business raising Angus and buffalo, which puts more locally produced meat into the supply chain. The Oneida also raise fruit in several orchards. Five hours to the north, near Bayfield, Wisconsin, on Lake Superior, the Red Cliff Band is seeing the benefits of a fish processing facility launched in the fall of 2020. Because of the federal funds, the Red Cliff Fish Company has not only added more employees, but is paying native and non-native fishermen more for their catch. You know, it kind of started off as a, an idea to uh, provide a opportunity for Red Cliff fishermen who weren't always treated as fairly by you know, other, other places. They would get, again, different pricing. Because now that we're here, uh, we technically have brought the market up in this area. 
as early as 2018 is kind of the last record I've seen. Most whitefish prices around there range around 30 to 40 cents a pound. Um, currently, uh, with our buyers, we are at um, $1.25 to $1.35 per pound. With the you know, government funding of these programs, it's been great because now it's meeting a need where we're providing a healthier protein alternative to you know, some of those other processed fishes or meats. Again, these are the programs. It's providing an opportunity for a place like this to succeed. Hamden says an announcement about another $3.5 million for additional demonstration projects will be coming. Tribal leaders across the country are hoping these allocations allowing greater food sovereignty will become permanent with the next farm bill. We visited the Oneida tribe in Wisconsin as well as the Menominee Indian tribe. And um, we did uh, see some of the products. Uh, we saw the, the ground bison and the wild rice and the beef chuck roast, and it just looked amazing. We are fully committed to supporting the restoration of indigenous food and empowering the indigenous agricultural economies and improving indigenous health uh, through traditional foods. Again, that USDA program is called the Indigenous Food Sovereignty Initiative, launched last November. For more info, visit online at usda.gov slash tribal relations. Well, next week, one of my favorite Farm Week stories, Tree Farm Economics. We head to the peaceful town of Aberdeen, Mississippi. There we meet Mr. Bobby Watkins, whose tall pines planted more than 30 years ago are both his retirement income and his legacy. Mr. Watkins was born to be a tree farmer. His love of the land sustains the here and now and will cradle generations to come. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. See you next week. Thanks for watching.